Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, we are going to start the webinar now. Uh, this is Richard speaking. So we will go through a company update followed by two sector reports, uh, the Singapore strategy, US trades monthly update and the Philip 20 uh, November monthly review. So let's uh, go into the presentation now. So uh, last, we'll start with ComfortDelGro. Last Friday, they announced their joint venture with Uber. We are not changing any forecasts. And uh, so we maintain buy and same target price, 269. Um, so what happened is that they'll be acquiring a 51% stake in Lion City Holdings. And this Lion City Holdings owns 100% of Lion City Rental. That is uh, Uber's car rental business. So this LCR has a fleet of about 14,000 vehicles and the sale consideration uh, of uh, 295 million is based on the NAV of 12,450 vehicles. We are just going to provide a quick rundown of some of the positives and negatives that we think of this uh, acquisition. So first off, this will give them access to the burgeoning private hire vehicle business and it can offset some of the decline of taxi segment. So take note that for PHV, there's actually two parts. There's the asset heavy part and the asset light part. So the main Uber parent operates the asset light part which is the uh, app based platform and then the asset heavy part is their Lion City rental. So uh, ComfortDelGro's stake in this uh, PHV business is on the asset heavy aspect of it. Uh, next second bullet point is um, this will be an alliance between the two market leaders in terms of fleet size. Sorry for the typo, this should be leaders. <laughs> uh, so, as you can see, um, sorry, so for Comfort Delgro and CityCap, they have access to about uh, 14 to 15,000 taxis. And whereas the other four taxi companies, there's only about uh, 9,500 taxis. And for Lion City Rental, there's uh, 14,000 vehicles. As for um, Grab's own uh, rental business, as Grab Rentals, they have a partnership with some of the other car rental companies like SMRT's Stride and the other um, electric taxi. So that part uh, is probably about a few thousand uh, vehicles only. So in that sense, you can see that in terms of taxi and normal vehicles, uh, both Comfort Delgro and uh, Lion City Rental are the market leaders in fleet size. Next thing is a net positive effect for Comfort Delgro's engineering maintenance segment as uh, this fleet of 14,000 vehicles uh, will likely be uh, put under maintenance by um, the parent, but take note that not all um, the earnings will accrue to them as uh, they still hold a 51% stake. So in this uh, intercorporate transaction, they'll probably only uh, benefit from the 49% that they do not own. So the negatives about this uh, acquisition is it does not directly address the decline in taxi business. Uh, while they say that now the Uber platform will be available to the taxi drivers, but uh, we don't think that that will be much of a help if the taxi drivers do choose to shift to drive a PHV full-time. Uh, this, this move does not um, help to maintain driver stickiness or um, address the decline in their fleet size. So the uh, last thing obviously is that as I mentioned, this uh, access to the PHV business is on the asset heavy side. So uh, eventually they will have to incur uh, capex whether to replace the vehicles or uh, when they need to increase the fleet as well. This is uh, somewhat um, 
in the opposite direction of what we have seen in the first nine months uh, for Comfort Delgro, where actually their uh, cash flow has increased despite um, the lower profits. The cash flow has decreased because they were not um, renewing their taxi fleet uh, as before. So they have let uh, some of the taxis, uh, they have scrapped some of the taxis and uh, did not buy new taxis. So that's what, how their uh, cash flow was improved. So just to recap again, uh, we didn't make any changes or forecasts uh, pending more details and conclusion of the deal. So uh, we have kept our buy and target price unchanged. And now we move on to Guangzhou who will talk about the coal sector. Hi, good morning, it's Guangzhou here. So the next hour uh, we'll talk about the Singapore Coal Monthly Update. Our title is Only Seasonal Headwinds. So um, let's take a look at uh, what happened over the past one month. The China, the NDRC, they urge uh, the domestic supply, coal suppliers and purchasers to enter into the term contracts for 2018 uh, in November. So in Indonesia, the governments um, the, in the Kal East Kalimantan uh, province had revoked uh, 406 uh, coal mining permits and there will be another 403 permits are waiting to be revoked in the future. So what do, how do we view these two uh, events? So in China side, we think that uh, the authorities move will gradually subdue the crow price volatilities moving forward. As of now, the coal price was still traded at the red zoom uh, in the recent month. So the red zoom is uh, based on the price alert mechanism that is established uh, early on this year. That means the coal price um, is not sustainable um, is not sustainable uh, moving forward because um, it is too high for the um, power plants. So um, over the past um, one month um, China was facing the shortage of coal supply to those uh, domestic um, power plants and also we think that the term contracts will provide uh, more visibility for the coal supply and demand uh, next year. So the Indonesian side, we think that um, the government uh, stamp out the irregularities um, will only cause the regional temporary supply shocks. Uh, why? Because we think uh, the national electrification project uh, will continue for the next couple of years. So the mining activities definitely will be resumed once all these issues are ratified. So here we will explain why uh, the three counters, the Geo, uh, Gear and Geo and also Black Gold are uh, as such a huge uh, price correction recently. Uh, because we think that there, there was a bearish uh, market sentiment for the coal sector uh, over the past few months. Uh, because in China, uh, most of the power and heating plants had completed the stocking powering coal for winter. That means uh, in the fourth quarter, we think that the coal uh, demand will decrease and also um, in the recent weeks the Chinese uh, government accelerated the gas replacing coal campaign so also this move will drive um, the coal uh, demand lower and lastly um, it also banned the burning of the low-quality uh, coal briquettes for the 
residential he uh, heating. So all these um, events uh, led to the lower demand for coal in China. However, we think that um, these are the seasonal headwinds because um, usually during the uh, winter period, uh, China has been intensifying the regulation and control of the air pollution. And also, the shift from coal to gas uh, wouldn't be completed so easily and it will be a uh, long run for uh, in the future. So we still uh, maintain our buy call on this sector because we think that we think that the coal price will be stabilized in next year and also for these coal counters they will uh, ramp up their production capacity by averagely 40% in next year. So these are our um, Co um, checkers for our sector. So it is worth noting that um, for this year's the um, the guidance um, the sales target for for FY17 is much higher than this counters uh, actual sales last year. So compared to the regional peers. Actually, the, the ramp up of uh, production uh, is much higher. However, that PE is still lower than the peers average. So we think that as of now, these three counters uh, valuation is still undervalued. So next, I will pass on to Jeremy Tung to talk about Singapore Banking Monthly Updates. Uh, hello, uh, good morning. Um, so here, um, we'll be updating on some of the key drivers of the for the Singapore banks. So uh, in general, all the um, key drivers are actually looking good. And the October uh, domestic loans growth for Singapore is up 6.8%. It's the second consecutive month of acceleration. And the uh, Hong Kong October domestic loans growth um, was uh, at 22.3% year on year. Uh, particularly in the month of October, it was driven by um, the IPO loans, as you saw some of the um, very mega IPOs that were launched in uh, early November, like the China Literature and the Yixing Group. Um, second is the, the benchmark rates. The CYBOR and HIBOR spiked up at the end of November, uh, so it's signaling the um, an increase in the mortgage rates in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, particularly in Hong Kong, um, we see that the um, the reference uh, to high, uh, the mortgage uh, rates that are mortgage uh, loans that are referenced to the HIBOR uh, remains at a high percentage at about 90 odd, 90 odd percent. So uh, that would have uh, significant sensitive sensitivity to the increase in the high ball. Um, so uh, the other thing we will also look out for is actually the um, uh, the spread between the one month and three months high ball, and that's narrowing, and that would uh, actually be uh, beneficial for the. Um, uh, Hong Kong net interest margins, as generally the savings rates are benchmarked to the th uh, three months, and then the um, housing mortgages are benchmarked to the one month high ball. And as for asset quality, you can see that the strong economic growth continues to support the as um, to support the asset quality. Um, we also saw that the third quarter GDP growth uh, for Hong Kong was at 3.6% year on year, uh, that beat expectations. And Singapore uh, growth in October was 5.2% uh, year on year, which um, exceeded um, the, the expectations by a wide margin. Um, bankruptcy orders in Singapore are in, on a declining trend. Um, I'll just show you this part here, this um, Singapore bankruptcies. You can see that over uh, a multi-year uh, downtrend. And the Hong Kong mortgage delinquency ratio remains low at 0.02%. Uh, 
And as for the offshore oil and gas space, uh, we can see the uh, semi-submissibles uh, utilization have bottomed up, although the day rates uh, continue to be low and we have, we have not seen that bottoming out uh, uh, pattern yet. And the Asian, the Southeast Asian jackups, um, clearly the utilizations have already rebounded earlier this year and moved up to the levels last seen in uh, middle of uh, 2015. But day rates continue to be low. But we can see that this also, it, for, for in this particular uh, segment, it has bottomed out already. All in all, we find that the um, all the indicators of volume margins and asset quality point to a healthy fourth quarter for the banking sector. And the valuations continue to be undemanding at between 1.1 times to 1.2 times price to book. Thank you. And next, we have the Singapore strategy update. Oh, okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, th th this Paul here. Yeah, just a quick on on our December uh, uh, monthly. Um, what we mentioned was that the fourth quarter is still looking good. Um, most of the indicators uh, suggest that the economic conditions and, and profitability will, it, is still on the uptrend. Um, we, we, you can gauge this by the uh, data points such as the October semiconductor sales, which is up about 22%, and the multi-year, multi if not multi-decade highs in several indicators uh, such as the ISM new orders and uh, and uh, even Singapore PMI numbers. Uh, what is notable is that uh, we that China uh, the, is is slowing down. Uh, we when we look look at some of the activity indicators such as electricity, steel, and in particular property, uh, we notice some slowdown in in China. Uh, moving back to Singapore, uh, some of the sectors that's performing well is like Ma J uh, Jeremy mentioned, it's uh, banking. Uh, we see the uh, volumes and margins holding up well, and with uh, the Fed raising rate this week, this could put further upward pressure on Cyborg and, and for an uh, upward uh, strength for Singapore NIMS. On property, it's a, a bit slower, uh, especially on primary sales. Uh, this likely due to the uh, uh, fewer sales, uh, fewer launches, sorry. But on secondary market, we do see a very strong uh, performance, up almost 44%. In terms of our, our recommendations, uh, for those looking for yield, our picks will be Asian, pay TV, and also Ascendance. And again, for property, uh, the stocks we like is Capital Land, Chip and, and and Trading Bar and Velo. Uh, Banyan Tree has always been our uh, our re-rating story. Uh, and also for micro mechanics, it's the, uh, we like it for the exposure to and high correlation to the semiconductor cycle. And uh, again, um, banking it, it's again our uh, recommend recommended sector as we are heading to a perfect 2018 with rising margins, loans growth. Uh, and even uh, special dividends. Uh, for consumer, it's a lag beneficiary uh, because the data points have not revealed themselves yet, but we have a buy on Sing Song Dairy Farm and Thai Beverage. Uh, that's it for me. I'll move on to Kang Wei on US. Hi everyone, it's Kang Wei here for the US market. Uh, just give a very brief summary of our US trades if you've been following our um, uh, U.S. buying trades, um, we've been, I think we've done pretty well um, this uh, this year so far. So on this side, you can see the summary of closed positions. These are the uh, performance of the trades that we have since the beginning of the year till now. Um, new to this uh, closed positions, uh, Synchrony Financial, which if you've been following, we had an entry price of 29.5 and a take profit price of 35, which it hit at the end of November. Um, actually, uh, as of this month, uh, so the last close is a little bit higher than this, but we decided to uh, take profit at 35. Uh, as well as Nike, which also hit its target price in the 30th of November with a 60.21, when we had an entry price of 53.42. So overall, you can see that the average returns of all our US trades uh, sits about 11.59%, pulled down a little bit by the GNC holdings, which um, underperformed and hit our stop loss price in uh, October. Overall, I think we've done pretty well uh, as compared to the monthly performance of the major indexes, which you can see at the bottom of this um, uh, slide. So moving on to the open positions, uh, currently we still have four open positions, Disney, GameStop, AT&T, as well as Applied Optoelectronics. 
So um, GameStop is, uh, you can see, performing quite well compared to when we entered. Um, com and AT&T is uh, slowly coming back up. Uh, and whereas uh, Walt Disney and Applied Opto Electronics seems to be uh, underperforming a little bit. Um, for Walt Disney, uh, basically our views are unchanged and we remain optimistic on Disney's uh, strong library of content as well as their future streaming plans. Uh, especially for their Disney content and ESPN, which will launch uh, late next year and early 2019. So Disney actually was up a little bit in the, I think, first week of this month on the rumors of uh, acquiring Fox Media content, which the talks are still ongoing. So if successful, this will actually allow Disney to have access to the X-Men franchise as well as the Fantastic Four, which I think will uh, continue to provide strong... Uh, potential content after the Infinity Wars uh, coming next year. Um, besides that, you also have Star Wars, which is releasing um, on Thursday uh, globally. And the first uh, of the new trilogy, Star Wars Episode 7, was actually the third highest grossing movie of all time. So while we don't expect um, Episode 8 to have the same uh, performance, I still think it should be pretty good. Uh, and that is going to continue to fuel, I think, growth in the Disney's um, content side. So overall, it's still long Disney. Uh, besides that, um, we'll talk about GameStop next, which uh, this is the second time we're entering into GameStop. And uh, the reason for that is uh, we believe that this new cycle of video game hardware, uh, namely the Nintendo Switch as well as the Xbox One X, which is the upgrade of the Xbox One, um, cou coupled with this holiday season, with the uh, Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and Christmas coming up, uh, so probably uh, we we suspect that it would help drive sales for GameStop Corp and be able to uh, push their sales numbers up for the next quarter results. So previously, the market had I think uh, beaten GameStop up quite a bit, and um, to the to the point where we suspect that it's undervalued. So this we, sus uh, we, we feel will help boost their sales numbers up. As for AT&T, uh, you can see that it, um, uh, slightly earlier, when we first released this earnings, uh, this, this uh, trading buy, um, the stock actually performed well because it seemed that um, the merger with Time Warner was going to be accepted and passed through, but the Department of Justice had has now come up to object against the uh, merger with Time Warner. So there's a proposed hearing by the DOJ on the 7th of May 2018, but uh, AT&T has requested for an earlier date of 20th February next year. So we will continue to monitor this situation and keep you up to date. Um, AT&T has actually offered a compromise for a seven-year blackout ban, meaning that for seven years after the merger, they will... Um, they will continue to supply their content to all distributors and um, they're banning themselves from blacking out uh, distributors for their content. So as a concession to the DOJ, um, other previous uh, mergers by uh, similar mergers has passed through before with, with similar compromises. So um, suspect that eventually they will come to a deal that will allow the AT&T and Time Warner to merge. And um, besides that, in other news, the another big thing that will be coming up for AT&T as well as all other telecoms will be the December 14 um, Federal Commission, Communications Commission, the FCC's vote on net neutrality. So just a very brief uh, summary of what net neutrality is. Um, it's a regulation on in the US side that basically uh, requires all ISPs uh, to treat all internet traffic as the same meaning that you can't discriminate between different forms of internet traffic. Uh, so, for example, if you like watching Netflix compared to HBO or Hulu, um, ISPs at this moment, they can't um, throttle your Netflix speed in favor of HBO or Hulu. But the FCC is voting to repeal such regulation on the 14th of December, and this looks uh, quite set to pass, the, the repeal of this regulation. So what will happen is after the, they pass this uh, and the legislation goes into place, um, ISPs can actually discriminate or favor uh, different forms of internet traffic. So for example, Comcast, which owns part of Hulu, can actually put Netflix into the, snow, the slower internet traffic uh, compared to Hulu, which means if you want to stream movies from Netflix, you 
potentially they might they will be able to um, slow down the speed in which you can stream the movies from there in favor of uh, faster speeds from Hulu. So this is something to watch out for if you are in, invested in the either telecommunications or internet-based companies such as uh, Facebook, Netflix, and you, uh, Google through YouTube. Uh, next company is the Applied Opto Electronics Inc. AOI. Uh, basically, our views remain unchanged despite the underperformance. We um, believe that the market has overly punished them for weakened Amazon uh, revenue demand. Uh, but in their latest earnings report, you can see the non-Amazon revenue has actually continued to grow and that they are transitioning to new uh, hardware on their data receivers. And we believe that it's because of this transition that has caused the Amazon demand to fall off. Um, so if in the event that uh, the transition is completed and Amazon revenue picks up again, I think you should be able to see the market um, reward A AOI more. Um, with that, I'll pass on the time to Jeremy Ng to talk about his Philip 20 portfolio. Uh, thanks, Kangwei. Uh, so, Jeremy speaking here. So, uh, we'll take a quick dive uh, into what happened around November for the Philip 20 portfolio. <clears throat> but before that, uh, we'll just take a look at the STI. So here's the weekly time frame chart on the STI. Uh, and as you can see over here, the main highlight that I want to put out here, as you can see the uptrend that has been established since uh, 2016, has been sort of a firmly intact. And what I mean by that, as you can see, uh, STI has been forming this series of higher highs and higher lows uh, since 2016, March each period. And more importantly, you can see uh, in September, November each period this year, uh, we actually booked out uh, another new 52 weeks high, which was this particular high over here at 3356 point. So ultimately last month, you can see that bullish break above this 3356 uh, points here actually uh, established uh, another higher high point within this particular uptrend. Again, uh, giving further confidence that this uptrend is still uh, well intact. But importantly right now, uh, there is this immediate roadblock ahead uh, at this 3457 point. And how we actually get to this number is... Uh, you can see these two highlighted regions over here back in 2013 as well as 2014-2015 each period. Uh, that was a point whereby some sort of uh, <clears throat> obstacle was being placed within the market for further upside. So you can see during this period over here, uh, STI actually crumbled around 12% or so. And some slight uh, minor reaction over here back in around March of 2015 whereby STI fell around 3%. So even more recently, you can see over here, I think two weeks ago and last week, you can see some sort of uh, market reaction happening at these 3, 4, 5, 7 points again. So as of now, we are seeing an uh, immediate roadblock at this particular level. And probably we might see some sort of uh, near-term correction first before this uh, long-term uptrend actually take that control. And <clears throat> more, another angle to look at this is uh, at this bottom panel shows the relative strength index. So a reading above 70 uh, shows us overbought condition and uh, likely correction is uh, going to happen. And you can see during this period here, around June of 2013, <clears throat> that was when RSI hit a high of 77, and you can see uh, the market actually went into a correction. And same one here, more recently, in around uh, August, September each period, whereby the RSI hit a high of 72, and ultimately hit into a minor correction of 3 to 5%. So right now, the weekly RSI, again, is in the overbought kind of a condition, uh, currently at 71. Uh, signaling to us that there might be a near-term correction uh, ahead of us. And right now with the immediate roadblock at 3, 4, 5, 7 resistance area, uh, we might actually see the correction coming into the market real soon. So keep a look out. But ultimately, with this particular uptrend, still look firmly uh, intact. Uh, the ultimate target right now uh, for the bulls uh, is definitely this 2015 high of around 3, 4, 3, 5, 4, 9 points. Uh, however, taking a look at the daily time frame shows uh, more strength within the underlying uh, trend. So here's the STI on the daily time frame and red line shows the 20-day moving average, blue line shows the 60-day moving average. And as you can see over here, I've highlighted this two point uh, to showcase how this uptrend right now is being supported. So you can see every minor correction that is happening at least on the daily time frame right now since November has been firmly supported by the 20 and 60-day moving average as well as last Friday's price section shown by this particular green bar over here. So from the daily point of view perspective, uh, what we see is uh, if price would have managed to actually close above this 3, 4, 5, 7 immediate roadblock that I was talking about in the previous slide, 
uh, just a daily bullish post above these three, four, five, seven points, then uh, we believe that the market should continue to move higher to retest the 2015, I mean 20, uh, 2015 high of three, five, four, nine points. So ultimately, the correction might not actually come so soon uh, if we actually close above these three, four, five, seven points. And right now, just move into the performance for the Philip 20 portfolio, uh, which is a technical portfolio that we constructed since May. Uh, as you can see over here, here's the uh, realized PNL for November. Uh, we have closed out five positions, uh, two with profit, Valutronics and Hopa, uh, at the respective dates uh, around this period over here. Uh, basically, the reason why we closed out these positions is because of the various price action that was exhibited back then. And as well as these three counters over here, Chasen, OUE and Black Gold, which have uh, all hit their stop loss due to the momentum that's fading off. And then new entries wise, uh, we have three new entries for the month of November. So Red Talk, uh, Golden Agri and Sino Star Pack were the three of the counters that entered. And just a quick chart on the performance wise. So here's the November performance. So November was a pretty bad month for the Philip 20 portfolio, mainly due to the sort of uh, momentum uh, fading off for all the momentum stocks. So particularly within the semiconductor space as well as the uh, property space, uh, we saw some sort of a uh, correction happening in the month of November, which now ultimately dragged down our portfolio performance. And then you can see STI performance for the month of November still remain uh, pretty well above uh, positive 1.8%, uh, mainly being propped up by the uh, banking stocks. So all in all, that dragged, up, dragged down our total return performance since May to uh, 5%. Uh, and the total performance for the STI uh, from May to November is 8.12%. And in terms of watch list wise, uh, currently we have 16 stocks within the portfolio and our max is 20 stocks. So here is the watch list that we are currently watching to add on more stocks to fill in the uh, capacity for the TV20 portfolio. And all these stocks over here are sort of a same thing over here, momentum, uptrend kind of a stock. So what we want to catch over here is the deep to reposition ourselves back into the uptrend. And ultimately, here's the current snapshot of the uh, portfolio as of uh, last Friday. Uh, nothing much to highlight, just that, as I mentioned again, momentum has been fading off. That's why we see more of a rate kind of a situation happening within the portfolio, uh, near zero to near negative 5%. And hopefully, moving forward, uh, momentum might actually come back into the market, whereby we see a turnaround within the uh, PNL for this uh, current snapshot. Yeah, with that, uh, we've come to the end of uh, today's webinar. We'll leave the rest of the time for Q&A if there is any. Thank you. Hi, there's a question on Kojan's offer from Costco uh, asking that the IFA from CIMB has said the offer price is fair and reasonable. Is there a reaction or word from Philip Research side? Uh, so there's no change, uh, just uh, refer to the most recent report. So recommendation is still uh, to reject the offer.
Uh, there's a question on Fraser's Logistics and Industrial Trust. Uh, we don't cover that stock, so I uh, can't give the answer about whether the acquisitions for 2017 are completed. Uh, also, have um, not, not able to um, talk about the incremental DPU. Now there's a question for Comfort Delgro. Uh, who are the two market leaders in terms of fleet size? So the two market leaders are uh, Comfort and CityCap, and um, that's for taxi. Uh, and for rental fleet, that is um, Lion City Rental. Uh, there's a question on the comparison between uh, Golden Agri and Wilma. Uh, we do not cover soft commodities at the moment. Yeah, there's a question on Line City Rental, is it profitable and how much goodwill is recognized in the books? So actually, um, we're trying to find that out whether it's profitable or not. Uh, but as for the question about goodwill also, um, we have not been able to get in touch um, with ComfortDelgo yet. We're still trying to find out about um, the acquisition price because if you work backwards and you look at the acquisition price it actually uh, appears that they will recognize some negative goodwill instead of uh, uh, the normal goodwill so uh, that's something that we are going to look into as well Uh, there is a question asking about uh, whether the coal prices are expected to rise next year. So uh, I would say that uh, let's take the 4,002 GAT uh, ICI coal price as the proxy. Uh, at Softdown, it was traded at around $50 per ton. So based on our um, forecast, we think that it will decrease a bit because as uh, this at this current price level is the year today high almost hit um, last year fourth quarters um, high in the recent five years 
so we think that um due to the uh china's domestic uh coal price regulation and control as well as the um, uh indonesia's um pln's um uh uh price uh regulation we think that the coal price will come down a little bit um maybe around um 40 dollars per ton around that level thanks Hi, there's a question on uh, regarding palm price uh, and will this benefit the palm related stocks? Um, sorry, we, we do not cover any of the soft commodity stocks at the moment. Yeah, there's a question on uh, any comment, uh, any recommendation of good counter to buy. Uh, probably you can look at our morning note. Somewhere near the back, there's a list of stocks that we currently cover. You can go through that list. Uh, yeah, thanks.
Hi clients, this is the Te Hong here. We have a question on Astreads and the question is about the outlook for Astreads going into 2018. So for Astreads, in fact, we have most of them already hitting our target price with the exception of Ascenders Read, which we have an accumulate call on and a target price of 286. So at the current moment, we are reviewing the strategy for 2018 and we're working on a strategy piece. So do look out for the piece over the next uh, week or so. All right, uh, since there are no more further questions, uh, we are going to end the webinar here. And we have one uh, announcement, and that is um, this will be the last webinar for this year. So uh, there won't be any webinar next week or uh, the week after. So uh, do tune in in um, four weeks' time because uh, the first Monday is a public holiday as well. Yeah, okay, bye.